You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 6, 2013, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, food allergy. Our presenter is Dr. Wesley Burks. He's the current and distinguished professor and chair of the Department of Pediatrics at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. So we're going to go ahead and get started with the food allergy presentation. This this is a topic that I think all of us just, uh, we all struggle with. There's so many patients who are coming in with food allergy now. It's, it's become like the main hot topic, and Dr. Bork has him put, him, put himself into the very center of this whole thing by becoming one of the main experts in the field of food allergy. Uh, so we're really glad to have you giving this presentation today. It's extremely uh, salient to what we do. We, we see so many people with food allergies. There's, so many questions, and we were very anxious to hear what you have to say. So welcome to Conferences Online Allergy, Dr. Burke. I'm going to give you control of the keyboard and mouse. Okay. All you have to do is to move your mouse, and you'll be in control. Okay, great. There you go. There we are. So the first first thanks for letting me talk to you today. And so stop me at any time if you have questions or thoughts, and it's better to do it when you have that thought. So this is a disclosure, and I don't think there's anything that precludes the discussion we'll have today. So the background Jay already alluded to as far as the, the prevalence of disease, um, there, there are 3 million children that have food allergy now. We know and it seems in the last 15 years there's have been almost a 20% increase. Uh, we know some children have lifelong disease and some it's more transient, although for milk and egg allergy it's probably less transient than we thought that for AD to 90 percent of them, they don't outgrow it until adolescence now, and I think that is different than we saw 30 years ago. I think the, uh, the second bullet I have there, uh, there's an author, Graham Rook, and this is one of his articles from 2010, but he's written a series of articles about evolved dependence, and I think it makes a lot of sense in this, when we go to the discussion that we won't do today about why there's more allergic disease. And so I would just commend to you some of his articles and thinking about that. So peanut allergy, we'll talk a lot about, uh, again, the change in prevalence in the last few years. The most common cause of anaphylaxis in the children's emergency department, the most common cause of fatal anaphylaxis. So where we are now, the standard of care is a good diagnosis, appropriate use of the laboratory test, and then avoidance of that food, and then helping the family find out when they're going to outgrow the disease. Some do early in childhood, some do later in adolescence, and some don't at all. And it's our role to try to help them find out when that is. There's not really a proactive interventional therapy. There are numbers of types that we'll talk about today that are in progress. If you think about the approval of a drug, there's the the initial phase one, there's phase two, and phase three studies. Most everything that we're going to talk about today are phase one or early phase two in that vernacular. Not all of them are going through that process. Some have other processes that are in work, but that's where it is. So there's really not anything that I think is the right thing to do right now, but we'll have that discussion as we go along. So a couple of definitions to talk about first. Desensitization, meaning while you're on treatment, you'll tolerate more food on a food challenge. And then tolerance, Uh, There's not really a good definition of what tolerance is. You'll see it as you get deeper into the literature. When we talk about tolerance today, we're talking about off-treatment for a period of time. Tolerance will evolve whether you talk about off-treatment for a month or three months or six months or a year. Article last year in the New England Journal about one of the things we'll talk about today, the editors didn't want to use the word tolerance because there's no good definition, so they talked about a sustained unresponsiveness. But I think it's important as you evaluate the literature on this topics that when people talk about desensitization and tolerance, you understand that. And then understand when they say tolerance, do they mean a month or three months or six months off therapy because it changes over time. So this is a cartoon from an article that Anya Nowak and Hugh Sampson did a couple of years ago. And on the upper left are allergen-specific, upper right are allergen-nonspecific, and the top half are those that are in studies, the bottom half are preclinical. And the only thing that's changed about this slide is that on the bottom half, the upper left of it, the heat killed E. coli actually has been through a phase one study. And we'll take time to talk about each of 
or some of these, not all of them, as we go through in the next few minutes. So the ones I'm underlining are the, the primary ones that I want to give you a little bit more data about and, and talk about as we come to through the talk. So this is the paradigm of food immunotherapy for any of the studies that we talk about, whether it's oral, sublingual, patch, whatever, and how this is compressed or lengthened is different on every study. So every study on oral immunotherapy, as an example, is not comparable because this schedule is different. So the side effects are different if you do it shorter versus longer. And then if you compare oral and sublingual, again, the side effects are going to be different depending on how quickly you go through this typical regimen. This is not anything different than you might for a drug desensitization or regular immunotherapy. So there's an initial dosing. There's a time for a buildup. In most of the studies, we're talking about an increasing dose every two weeks with a daily home dose but it varies and you have to look at that in the study that you're evaluating. There's a maintenance phase. Maintenance dosing for oral immunotherapy ranges from 300 milligrams of the food to 4 grams every day. A period of time that they remain on maintenance and the outcome changes if that maintenance phase is a year versus two versus three versus longer. And We'll talk about that. And then the question about tolerance when you stop the treatment and then you do the tolerance challenge, how long is it between those two red circles? Is it 1, 3, 6, 12 months? And again, the outcome is going to be really different. So first, we're going to talk about heated milk or egg. This is, out of these studies, this is really the only thing that's changed clinically what I do in the last five years in the sense that, and we'll talk about it and then I'll come back to that. So these are studies primarily out of Mount Sinai, but other places on the therapeutic effect of heated milk and heated egg in a child's diet. So in this study, it's published a few years ago, that milk allergic children, we know that as you outgrow milk allergy at the beginning, you're likely allergic to all forms of milk. As you outgrow it, you'll tolerate heated milk. And when we say heated, most of this refers to like 350 in an oven greater than 15 or 20 minutes. That's an overgeneralization, but that's about where it is. And then you outgrow all of it. So as you see here, they did challenges and looked at those that might be able to tolerate the heated product. And you can see about three quarters of those that were allergic to milk could tolerate the heated product. If they gave them or put in their diet the heated product at the end of a couple of years, then it accelerated their tolerance acquisition so they could stop the treatment and be able to tolerate the food. Same statistics are true for egg after a couple of years. Many of them will be able to tolerate the food. That took longer if you didn't introduce the heated product into their diet. The questions that remain about this are, how do you identify, or do you have to do a challenge up front for everyone who might be tolerant to a baked product, the dose that you need to use, the degree of heating, what I said was an overgeneralization, and then the role of the food matrix that the heated product is in. Those aren't well worked out, so what people are doing and their clinical practices varies, I think, pretty widely right now. So you can see here some Kaplan-Meier curves looking at those that introduced a product in their diet versus those that didn't, how quickly they could then introduce the real food in their diet. So definite differences. So now we're going to talk about oral immunotherapy, and we'll pull in context of several different studies. These are representative of, I think, all of them and what we'll talk about, both the positive effects and the side effects of it. So oral meaning you take the food and you put that food in another food. Peanut powder shown here that would be mixed in applesauce or ice cream and then taken. Sublingual as a liquid fitting underneath the tongue and held a couple of minutes and then swallowed. So obvious differences in, your, in the amount of protein that you can take on a daily basis. So there have been a number of studies on oral immunotherapy now worldwide. The literature started 60, 70 years ago, there were case reports of allergic children being given food orally in the way of immunotherapy. You see case reports in the 30s and 40s. You don't see it in the 50s, 60s, up through the 90s. And then some case reports started. And about 10 years ago, you started seeing studies initially open and now blinded that give us a better idea about both the clinical and the immunologic effects of it. So we're going to talk about different studies, the 
the consortium of food allergy research, a oral immunotherapy study published about a year ago that was a multi-center study, and then a single-center study on peanut oral immunotherapy. So the first one from the consortium of food allergy research, these were 55 kids greater than five years, median age was between five and seven, 40 on egg oral immunotherapy, 15 on placebo. It was a, the multi-center we talked about, a blinded treatment through 48 weeks. And you can see here at the end of 10 months of treatment, those on placebo, when challenged, so we're given a five gram challenge while on therapy, so that's the desensitization word we talked about earlier, versus those on therapy, half on therapy could tolerate the challenge, none on placebo. If we then continue the therapy for 12 more months, so now at the end of almost two years, none of those on placebo could tolerate the challenge, while three quarters did on the treatment. So a definite desensitization effect, and this is really the first multi-center trial that showed that. If we then go to talk about that sustained unresponsiveness, so taking those that were tolerant at 75%, so they were desensitized, and then taking them off for four weeks, now you only have about a third of the group. So you go from three quarters to a third that lost that in four weeks. So a relatively rapid change. Those that were challenged tolerated much more than you would have expected prior to entering the study, and that the median dose of a reaction for egg is about 100 milligrams. So we did a 10 gram challenge. Most of them tolerated two to five milligrams if they didn't tolerate the whole amount. So a definite difference that's still there, but they lost that ability to tolerate 10 grams in as short as four weeks. If we now continued the oral immunotherapy for another year and looked at those that were tolerant, it was about half of them could then stop the product and put egg in their diet. So now we're going to look at the peanut oral immunotherapy, similar study design, but now using peanut, 25 subjects, six active treatment, nine on placebo, three withdrew because of logistical reasons. And so you can see that as we walk through this, the oral food challenge was done, again, four weeks after stopping it. The oral immunotherapy was done somewhere between three and five plus years. At the end of one year, if you did the challenge, you can see those on placebo, and that's a median of about 150 milligrams in this study versus those on treatment tolerated 5,000 milligrams. The treatment here was 4,000 milligrams. The treatment in the egg oral immunotherapy was 2,000 milligrams. So you can see differences in those on treatment versus placebo. If we now looked at those that were able to stop the treatment, that sustained unresponsiveness, if we talk about intent to treat, then about 40% per the protocol, those that finished, it was a little bit more than half. So even going out for five years, not all of them received a long-lasting benefit once you stop the therapy. So if you look at the peanut IgE results at the beginning of the study, those that would become tolerant, you can see, have much lower IgEs versus those that eventually did not develop tolerance. If you look at the peanut IgE as you walk through the study, then those at the beginning, you can see those in red were those that eventually did not become tolerant. And over time, you can see those, the increase in IgE in that group, but not a bump up in IgE in the other group. And then at the beginning, both are much lower than at the end versus the beginning, but you have definite differences. So if you look at regulatory T cells, what we anticipated would happen was it would go up with treatment and it would stay up, but what we saw number-wise at least between 12 and 24 months, the numbers of regulatory cells go down. Functionally, we don't know if they increase their capacity, but this is consistent in other studies now. If you look at IL-5, it changes. IL-13 changes over time. And then the IL-10 to IL-13 ratio goes up. Again, things that you might expect for other types of allergen immunotherapy. So now we're going to talk about sublingual. So again, sublingual meaning a liquid placed underneath the tongue, a certain number of milligrams. These studies are once a day, and then look at the outcome of them. So there's a COFAR peanut study, a multi-center, and then a single-center peanut sublingual. So the COFAR study, 40 subjects, adolescents and young adults, so the adolescents were greater than 12. And you can see at the end of the week 44 and the week 68 visit, 
the amount of food that they could tolerate on a challenge. But if that amount, so you can see at the end of 68 weeks, they could tolerate about a gram. The oral immunotherapy ones, we were talking about 5-gram challenges and 10-gram challenges. So tolerating more, but definite differences in oral versus sublingual. If you look at now the peanut sublingual study, a single center study that I'm having trouble the next one coming up. So let's see it. Okay. So this is at the end of one year. So a food challenge at the end of one year while on treatment. So you can see these are younger kids. Their peanut IgEs were all greater than seven. They had a I hit, we challenged them at the beginning and then at the end of one year. And those on treatment tolerated about 1,700 milligrams. Those on placebo, it was less than 100 milligrams. But you also can see in the left-hand part of the slide definite differences, what uniform in their response in all of them. You can see on the, on the right the differences in skin test, those on placebo versus those on treatment. Then what I'm going to talk about is a study that actually has been published that combined sublingual and oral. These, there were three study groups eventually. Everyone started on sublingual. Can you see my pointer? Mm -hmm. yes. OK, so everyone started on sublingual. And then at the, a period of six weeks, a, a group went on, continued on sublingual. And then there were two oral groups, a larger and a smaller dose. So. Eventually, there were three groups, and they followed them over time, did challenges here, and then off of therapy. So sublingual to begin, and then divided into continuing sublingual or two doses of oral. And then what you'll see as we walk through the next slide, this is the sublingual group alone. So if you compare time one to at the beginning, while they're on treatment, there are definite differences. If you look at the oral doses, the lower dose versus the higher dose, again, that desensitization effect is higher, but they're on higher doses. And there's a little bit of difference in the two doses. And these were like 5,000 milligrams and 2 grams differences in B and C. So some of the, the gaps, I think, that are in where we are with oral and sublingual. And the reason that I would say with you that I don't really think it's the right thing to do clinically yet is that we know that in blinded studies, desensitization happens within really a few days of treatment. So that threshold starts to change. Uh, we know that the allergic side effects in oral immunotherapy in the beginning studies, about 20%. Now it's about 10% of children have major GI side effects, abdominal pain, vomiting, but not vomiting immediately with the dosing. It may be six, eight hours later. But once you stop the dosing, within a month, those symptoms go away. We know that with viral infections, with exercise, that and I'll give you an example of a child that's been taking two grams every day of oral immunotherapy for a year. They get a viral infection, have fever to 101. If you give them the dose that day, they can have an anaphylactic reaction. So you stop the dose, and then two days later, their fever is gone, and you give them the same dose again, and they have no symptoms, and they continue for days, weeks, months then, and have no symptoms. So they only had symptoms while they had fever. Exercise does that in some. And then there's a recent article that is a little bit different than some of the other reports. Excuse me, that off of therapy in the Hopkins milk or oral immunotherapy, that the symptoms were actually worse after they participated in the study. There are nice studies on the mechanistic effects of oral immunotherapy that really fall in line with other types of allergen immunotherapy. And again, we've talked about tolerance and whatever that word means. This hasn't been, hasn't been really shown in long-term big blinded studies. So now we're going to talk about epicutaneous. Uh, people call this the patch, all the different kinds of euphemisms. This is a, a slide from the company so that what they've done is they've developed a system that they can impregnate the material. So they've used, so far, milk and peanut. So they take the milk powder and put it electrostatically. They'll draw that into the patch. And then it leaches out over time into the skin for that patient that, or that subject that's receiving it. The initial safety studies have been done either replacing the patch every day or every two days. 
and they rotate the sites of how this is done. You can see in effect what they anticipate would happen with the dosing. I'm trying to go. I, so this is a result from their milk immunotherapy study. So a phase early phase two study, 16 kids, nine on treatment, seven on placebo. Uh, they did a baseline oral food challenge, and then after three months of treatment, you can see the differences. And I'll show you here. You can see uh, at baseline challenges while on treatment, and then here those that were on placebo and then put on treatment. What you really haven't seen in the epicutaneous studies or what we talked about earlier on the oral and sublingual are those children, the subjects that have this change here, but they've not been taken off treatment for any longer period of time and see how sustained this is. I think the sustainability is directly related, like any other type of allergy and immunotherapy, in the how long they're getting the amount of antigen. So the, the larger the amount of antigen, the longer they're on it, the more likely you'll see the side effects, or the effects, I mean, of being tolerant. So there's a, a peanut study that's just come out, and a later phase one study that has looked at the safety and you can see it's well tolerated in, in most kids. And these are the other studies that are going on. There's the Aero Child study, the VIPE study, the results have just been released in the early parts of it. And then COFAR is actually doing a, a larger study with it. And you can see here in the middle the different doses. Uh, this study will be the first one really that does the dosing and then stops it after a period of time. So now we're going to talk about uh, I'm going to try to skip on. There's a little bit of delay in what I'm seeing from, I think, what y'all are seeing. So we're going to talk about the monoclonal antibody treatment with anti-IgE. So now I'll talk about this in the context of treatment with anti-IgE alone and then treatment with anti-IgE with oral immunotherapy. So in the first study that was published about 10 years ago now, this was the precursor to omalizumab from a different company. and this. Treatment was used with three different doses of anti-IgE in peanut allergic adolescents and adults. And what they saw at the higher doses, that those that were on treatment pre and post challenge, while on treatment, they had a definite effect. But not everybody had the same effect. Because of the company, and it went out, and then Omelizabab morphed out of that. Then there was another study that was started about five years ago now, and it was stopped prematurely because of safety issues that happened during challenges, not with the drug itself. But again, what was seen is that some of the subjects, while they're on treatment, their desensitization effect that we talked about earlier went up, and it didn't really change in placebo. So now there are studies that have come out with pretreatment with omelizumab prior to starting oral immunotherapy. It doesn't really change the overall side effect profile in that there are similar percentages of kids that have allergic side effects. What it does allow so far in the small numbers of studies is that you go in that maintenance from zero to the maintenance phase is shortened because they are using anti-IG. But the percentage of side effects are still about the same. So the next group that we'll talk about, and I apologize for the red circle still coming up on the lines is the Chinese herbal therapy. And these are studies that have primarily come out of Mount Sinai, and Xu Min Li has been really the leader of it, and started almost 15 years ago. By her prior training in China, Xu Min knew that there was an herbal treatment that appeared to work for asthma. So she took that model and used it in a peanut allergic mouse model and refined the herbal formulation. And the herbal formulation she's using now is the Food Allergy Herbal Formula 2, so that's at phase 2. It's on the second line here. And there are nine herbs that are used. Uh, they've done a phase one study on it for safety. Uh, they are just finished in a phase two study uh, that has not been published yet in adolescents and adults with uh, various food allergies, not all just one food. The issues related to this uh, are, one, we don't really know what the active ingredient is. And they're working hard to try to identify that. Or if there is an active ingredient or ingredients, and it takes multiple ones to do this. In the phase two study, it took about 30 tablets a day for the treatment, which is practically not possible. 
but they are also working on trying to, as they identify the active ingredients, to obviously condense that so the treatment might be truly feasible. This is different in the sense that this is a generic treatment for any food allergy. As you see in the last line, it could use for any of them. The first ones we talked about were really very antigen specific. So now I'm going to leave that. I want to just ask a few questions for you to think about that when we talk about the terms tolerance and desensitization, and this really applies to any type of allergen immunotherapy. So I think it's clear from what we talked about that from this present studies, there is a desensitization effect, so the threshold goes up, but really can it be long-lasting in some or a greater or lesser degree? And really, I'd ask, is it possible for any of the allergic diseases that you can have long-lasting tolerance without some ongoing antigen administration on a regular basis to maintain that tolerance. The difference in the allergen immunotherapy studies for allergic rhinitis versus food allergy, if you treat someone for allergic rhinitis and their symptoms significantly improve, once off therapy, they can have, and I'm not minimizing this at all, but they can have a few more sneezes or their nose run a little bit more and it's not noticeable or it's not a big deal. So you could, your symptoms can come back to some degree. For food allergy, it's really not feasible to have that come back that you might have the risk of a serious systemic reaction. So the major questions, can we really produce that in food allergy? And even in any allergic disease, I'd ask that question as you think about that. So some of the mechanisms, the questions I'd think about with you, what is the mechanism for the development of allergic disease in food allergy? It's classically talked about as a defect in deregulatory responses. I don't know that we really know that based on the studies that are there if you really look at them. There are studies coming from this EAT study from Europe, from the COFAR studies here that may be able to answer that over time. What is true tolerance? Or can we develop true tolerance without ongoing antigen administration? So those studies, I think, will, will get some answers out of the LEAP study. There's a, actually a LEAP on study where children in LEAP that were treated will then be taken off their product for 12 months to see if it is a long-lasting benefit. And then as we look at longer-term studies in food allergy, there's a study starting with the Immune Tolerance Network called IMPACT for younger children with peanut allergy. There are other studies going on through the ITN and COFAR and others with OIT and epicutaneous studies, both individual allergens and multiple food allergens not really to look at the desensitization effect, but to look at the long-term tolerance effect. So I'll go ahead and stop now, and then we can have discussion or answer questions. So to think a few of the, the individuals, a number of people, when you do clinical studies like this, it takes a whole bunch of people. So particularly Brian Vickery and Mike Kulis here, Stacy Jones in Little Rock, and then Hugh Sampson for the COFAR work and others involved in that. So uh, again, thank you, and I'll Whatever discussion or thoughts you'd have, I'd be glad to talk about it. So it's good to talk to you. Um, thank you, Wesley. That was great. Um, um, I have a, a couple questions. One, um, when you were talking about your the oral um, and sublingual immunotherapy, um, and you were talking about extending it out for a year and two years, et cetera, were those patients all on daily therapy? Yes. Um, so the, for, all, for each of those studies I talked about, they're getting a daily oral immunotherapy of that powder, whether it's egg or peanut, and that powder is put in other food, and then like two tablespoons of applesauce, and they take the two tablespoons of applesauce with egg in it, that's their daily treatment. Um, had, have you ever um, spread that, that time period out like you do with like allergy shots where, you know, over time that you spread out the, the frequency of, or the, of the shot? Yeah. No, we've not. I mean, it's a good question about how frequent the antigen administration needs to happen. I, I think that we, everybody's done this, what they thought was the safest way possible, which is daily. I think after a certain period of time, you probably could space it out, but I, I don't know how, you know how long that might be. My bias is that once you stop the daily treatment to maintain that long-lasting tolerance, you have to have some regular administration, whether it's weekly or biweekly or whatever, to maintain that tolerance. I don't think you can totally stop the antigen being exposed to maintain tolerance. No, I was curious if it was more like, you know, in traditional immunotherapy where you can spread it out to two, three weeks or something. 
or is it more like when you desensitize someone to a drug where within 48 to 72 hours they're, you know, they're, they'll have symptoms again? The other thing, I guess, along those same lines is you talked about, and I've heard you talk about this before, about people being sick or even with exercise where they hold the dose. If someone had, you know, some viral illness where they're sick for four or five days or, um, um, you know, if someone's not compliant, um, yeah. what, I mean, what is the period where you where you concerned that they may have anaphylaxis if they start up again? Yeah, that's, a, again, a good question, Paul. I think what we've done in the studies is if they miss a day or two, then they have to talk to us, and we do this dosing at home. If they miss three or four days, again, they talk to us, and they come in and do the dosing in front of us. I can tell you, like, after four days, unless they still have the, the viral infection and fever, then people aren't reacting, but they've been on it for a while. So, but could they miss seven or eight days? We don't. I don't know because we've really not gotten there. Do you have a point where you where you say, well, you know, you've missed five days or something, so we're going to cut the dose by a third or a half or something, and then get back yeah. up. So what? Yeah. So again, like you would with standard sub Q immunotherapy, if they miss two days and they've had a significant side effect, then we may cut the dose in half for a couple of days. It's. I mean, we put that in the protocol, so it's pretty standardized. But after five days, then we brought them in to do, a, do the dosing in front of us. And sometimes we give them the same dose, and sometimes we cut it in half and then build back up quickly. We've just not gone, like, out beyond five days. You know, if somebody's missed it 10 days, then and that's not really happened so far. But if they were going to miss it 10 days, then we probably just drop them out of the study right now. Hmm. Yeah, Wesley? Yes. Uh, this is Brock Williams. Um, I, I'm curious to how much work you've done with components, and uh, and wouldn't it seems to me that that would certainly influence your patient uh, selection and and also the ones you might have success in and the ones you don't. Like for uh, for example, egg, uh, oval mucoid or oval albumin sensitized, that sort of thing. Yeah, so we've we've looked at it after we've done the study, not chosen anybody to participate and have the most results for peanut for like the, the standard components that you can get mm -hmm. now on the market. And uh, there really are not any differences. Like if you track the IgE to ARH2, then it pretty much follows the IgE to the whole peanut. Uh, as far as predicting who will respond or who doesn't respond, it, it doesn't really differentiate it like like the, uh, to the total IgE, the lower it is at the beginning, mm -hmm. the lower the total the IgE to ARH2 at the beginning. So it gives you the same results. So it hadn't really differentiated it so far. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Wesley, from your uh, kind of uh, gestalt from seeing these, these studies done, do you think um, um, sublingual is is better than oral or vice versa? Do you think one is better than the other as, as far as inducing whatever tolerance is? Yeah, so I, I can walk through both. Like both of them, the, the dose that you can get on a regular basis for oral is going to be always higher than you can with sublingual. And the doses that we're giving on sublingual on this were in the 2 milligram range every day. And that was with like roughly 10-ish drops. And so to get higher doses, you'd have to do it more frequently, which makes it a little bit harder to do. The oral, like I said, some of the studies have been done with 1,000, some with 2,000, and some with 4,000. So 4,000 milligrams of peanut protein, uh, you can hold your hands together in a cup, and it fills up your, your cup pretty well. So it's a lot of protein. It's practically you know, pretty hard to do. So the side effects of oral are greater than sublingual. The oral ones, the GI side effects we talked about, the changes with viral infections, with exercise, or some with menses, they actually react. Sublingual, the major side effects have been like other sublingual studies for airborne allergens and that it's oral itching and tingling. We have had a couple of systemic reactions that happened when the children took the dosing and then they coughed and then they aspirated the dosing or they appeared to like inhale them. And then they had a systemic reaction. So it's not without its total side effects. But generally, the, the side effects, there's not been the chronic GI side effects in sublingual. So the side effects are definitely 
less with sublingual. If you look at, at the end of a year or two years, the amount of protein that you can tolerate on a challenge is higher with oral. So the desensitization effect is higher, but they're getting a higher dose. And then stay stopping after three years. There's a lot more data on the oral. There's not enough on sublingual to really have a valid comparison to know who would be better for longer term tolerance. If you're only going to talk about desensitization, so giving someone a treatment and leaving them on the treatment, not trying to stop it, but leaving them on it, then sublingual is going to have fewer side effects and at least produce a desensitization effect above what normally would cause a positive challenge, which is going to be in the 100 to 200. Less than 200 milligrams are where most, most kids have reactions in axonal reactions. So it's way less than a peanut where most kids have an axonal reaction. Sublingual will give you that desensitization effect above that. So that's a long answer, but it kind of talks all around it, Paul. Hmm. Uh, Wesley, uh, I'd yeah. kind of like to go back to another point. In, and when you do the egg challenges, and you do the heated egg, and we yeah. all know that ovalbumin is thermolabile. And ovalbumin is 54% of the egg. And uh, uh, egg protein and ovomucoid, which seems to be the uh, a worse allergen, is only 11 percent. So w when you're giving, I mean, have you ever considered looking at uh, one without the other, or the two together, or anything like that? Because yeah, you're talking about for, for for treatment. Well, yeah, it seems like you're giving a much bigger dose uh, if you don't cook it of ovalbumin compared to ovomucoid. Yeah, I mean, we are, but I think in the, you know, just from a practical standpoint, trying to only give open mucoid, which would be the major allergen, mm -hmm. we would have to purify it, and that uh, to have just open mucoid alone, which is, uh, it's done, so you can buy a commercially available open mucoid, but the cost mm -hmm. of it's, you know, fairly significantly higher than just buying the crude egg. I mean, I think it's a reasonable study that could be done to see mm -hmm. if you would get a better effect. You probably could use less of it because of what you just said. Mm -hmm. but nobody's tried to, to try to do that yet just because of the cost. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Leslie, with the, um, with the patches that you described with the epicutaneous, um, was that, you said that was for, they have that for milk and for egg? Milk and peanut. Milk and peanut. The, the dose for the peanut that you'd get on the patch, how is that comparable to what you would do with sublingual or oral? So m most of the doses for the, um, I think I'm, I'm trying to remember the slide back. I think they're in the 100 and 250 microgram range. So that's what's in the patch. Uh, uh -huh. the sublingual is, as I said, about two milligrams. Hmm. So that, that's okay. the difference in the two of them. Um, do you think if the dosing um, could be higher in the patch that that there be a chance for more efficacy? I, I think so. I think any type of immunotherapy, at least the initial effects, you can get to faster with a higher dose. It's just whether the side effects are going to be too great, you know, as you go higher in the epicutaneous doses. They pick those doses based on the ones that had the least side effects, that, you know, when you put the patch on itself. Because mm -hmm. they you definitely have local side effects like redness, swelling, when you put the patch on in some kids. Mm -hmm. And to go to a much higher dose, I think it would increase the prevalence of that happening. Has anyone tried this with inhalants? I mean, the you, patch? Uh, yeah, uh, the yeah, patch. I or I've not seen published stuff, but I think the uh, company is, there's some either talk or some directions in that way, yes. And, and what's your feeling about the differences between inhalants and uh, foods? Do you think it's dose, do you think it's allergens, or do you think it's uh, some other variables? I, uh, I think that probably they're all um, pretty close. I think the differences in the outcome of what happens after immunotherapy. So if you look at the, the placebo control studies for uh, grass, even sublingual or injection immunotherapy. So you do it placebo, like Steve Dern studies, 
you do placebo for three years and treatment for three years. There's a clear difference in symptoms at the end of three years. But then, then you stop the, the treatment and then continue to follow the group. And if you measure number of sneezes, you measure rhinitis, whatever score you want to measure. So say the ones on placebo are at, are at five. I'm making the numbers up, OK? So mm -hmm. the, the placebo ones started at five, stayed at five. The treatment ones started at five or, or down to one at the end of three years. So you stop it, and at year four, the placebo ones are still at five. But now the treatment ones have gone from one to two or two and a half at, a, at the end of a year. So they're still better than they were at the beginning, but they're having more symptoms off treatment. Mm -hmm. What can't happen in food allergy is that that challenge now off treatment, you're going to have symptoms. You have significant symptoms or the likelihood of significant symptoms that can happen that you don't with allergic rhinitis. Mm -hmm. If you look at the insect venom immunotherapy, then you know for every few years that you go off, the IgE can go back up. It's mm -hmm. just the likelihood of stings is still pretty low. And so you don't forever have that less than 5% chance of having anaphylaxis while you're on treatment forever. That changes the longer you're off therapy. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the same in all of them. Once you stop therapy, if you're not having ongoing antigen and exposure, then it changes. The other difference in foods and airborne allergens is that if you do a grass study, even those on placebo are getting exposed to grass pollen, whether it's the spring or fall or wherever you live. Mm -hmm. So they get some microgram quantities. Foods don't really happen that way. You're not accidentally coming in contact with peanut milligrams on a regular basis if you're on a peanut avoidance diet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, Wesley. <clears throat> Sorry, I missed some of the talk, but what I heard was, was fantastic. The uh, question I had is we're, we're having a lot of patients who come in with uh, concerns about peanut allergy, and they want to sit at peanut-free tables, and they, they think that exposure to casual peanut is going to cause anaphylaxis, and they, they just are causing tremendous havoc in the schools and so on. How, how, do, you, how do you address those issues with those families? That, um, what I really try to get the discussion to, uh, Jay, is that what, what actually will cause a serious life-threatening reaction, mm -hmm. which is oral, in, oral ingestion. Right. So all of the life-ending episodes pretty much have been by oral ingestion. And not that you can't have symptoms when it's, if you put peanut butter on the skin, but that's not life-ending. And not that you can't, if you're peanut allergic and you smell the peanut shells, you're walking on them, not that you don't feel bad. But that's not a life-ending episode. And so it's really how do you help a child not ingest the food? It's not like if you and I are sitting together and I'm allergic and you're eating the peanut butter and jelly sandwich. As long as I'm not eating it, I'm not going to have a life-threatening reaction. I might smell it and it doesn't really smell very good. If you like threw the sandwich on me and I got peanut butter on my skin, I'd have some reaction. But it's not going to be life-threatening. So just trying to focus on how do you have a life-threatening reaction? It's really by oral ingestion, and that that kind of sets the table for how you need to take care of a school. Good, have you ever done like it. proximity challenges where you bring them in and just expose them to like airborne peanut and just to show them that it's not going to cause a problem? Do you do that sometimes? I, I've I no. I mean they've done some at Sinai. I know. I know. I know others have, um, but I'm not actually just. I mean, most of the time, just trying to have that discussion. But I think it's reasonable in some that if their their anxiety is so great that you're able to do that with them. Um, and there was a case in, I guess it was in California just recently, of a kid who died of a peanut anaphylaxis. And apparently, the father was a physician and gave a whole bunch of epinephrine, and the kid ended up yeah. dying. Anyway, yeah. and I started getting calls from parents wanting to know if they should just give up enough for, and if they think the kid might have ingested peanut before there's any symptoms at all. They're just yeah. so scared. I mean, this anxiety is, is, is crazy. And what, what do you yeah. think? Uh, one, that's really the first time that anybody has ever seen or reported somebody that um, really didn't respond to epinephrine early. Because, I mean, it seems, that, or it seems early in the reports. I think there may be more there than we don't know yet. I mean, I know that there are people through some of the organizations talking to them. But the child had a reaction and I think got three doses of epinephrine and still had a life-ending episode. I, I, I still feel pretty comfortable that if 
you get epinephrine early that it will take care of, it will prevent a life-ending life episode. I, I d don't go to the point of telling them if they know they have had an ingestion and they're not having symptoms to go into epinephrine. I, I think that would allow a lot of people to take a lot of epinephrine unnecessarily. I know some are anxious about that, and a lot of people have gotten similar calls to what you're talking about. But And it, again, there's not any evidence-based studies to what I'm talking about, so I totally understand that. <laughs> but right. I still try to talk to a family that here's the algorithm of the treatment. Uh, if you have symptoms, here's what you do. Here's when you do your antihistamine. Here's when you do your epinephrine, and not just treat if you think you had an ingestion. And I suspect there's more that went on than what we're hearing. The kid apparently threw up and may have aspirated, and that could have been the cause of death. We don't we don't really know the details of the of what yeah. really happened. Um, but but it is it is a rampant problem, and people are really scared about this stuff. Yeah. The anxiety level is so high, and somehow, as a, on a national basis, we need to do something to tone down the, the fear and anxiety that people have. Because you know. You touch a peanut and you get a little rash, and oh, that's life threatening. And people are tend to be imbalanced, exaggerated. Right, right. Now I understand. Uh, another question, uh, uh, Wesley. Have they looked at? Uh, I, I didn't notice. Maybe I missed it. On the effects of uh, oral or subcutaneous immunotherapy with respect to age. You know, you, very yeah. young kids versus older teenagers and blah blah. Yeah. So. Um, there's, um, I'm trying to think how to describe it. There, in the studies that I showed earlier, the, those that had a longer lasting effect had lower IgEs at the beginning than those that didn't. And so that information was translated into a study that Brian Vickery is doing now called the Devil Study. And it, those are kids that are less than four years of age that have begun treatment and they're on different doses. We know that from ages like one to five or six, that if you're peanut allergic, most people's peanut IgE goes up during that time frame, even though you're avoiding peanuts. Mm -hmm. So that's the normal occurrence. Sometimes it will go down, but only in the people that are losing their allergy. So most people's IgE goes up, which is kind of hard to explain to the family when they come back each year and you draw their IgEs again, and their IgEs are higher when they've been avoiding the food. So my bias is, and that's where this impact study is starting, is that the sooner you can start immunotherapy, if it's going to work, it'll be in the younger children with lower IgEs. Mm -hmm. Do you know, do most allergists do oral challenges, or is that something that is not done widely enough? I, I think that most don't. There are increasing numbers of, that do. I think what FAIR and the Academy and others tried to do last year, joint council with the college, is to get through a better coding and then billing mechanism for doing challenges mm. so that they're now codes that you can get better reimbursement. Before this, nationally, the median reimbursement for a three-hour food challenge was $70. I don't, I don't have the information now to know how it's changed with the change in coding, but it, it's not as much as seeing three hours worth of patients otherwise, but the billing is much better than it was before. So there's a better opportunity for people to try to do it, but it's still a minority of, of practicing allergists do it. Because right. if that resource isn't available in your community, there's no way to really figure out whether the patients are truly allergic or not without the accidental yeah. suggestion. Yeah, I think there's some recent, uh, and I'm blay, I, I think it's, uh, I, I hesitate to say which journal is, but it came out of the Boston group, and it looked at, and there's several others like this that are using Others are using algorithms to try to predict when a child's outgrown it and when you might do a challenge. So it lessens the chances of having a reaction. It actually lessens the challenge numbers you need by like 80%. But there's some good information on this study from children that came out maybe two months, three months ago that looked at predictors of challenge outcome, like on kids that you thought might have outgrown it. And there's some nice information about IgE levels, skin test size, uh, and then uh, components in that. And looking at challenging everybody in the study, but then looking at the outcome. And if you use you know, a couple of three predictors, you could likely not have to do a challenge and then say it's OK to do it at home if you meet ABC criteria. So okay. I, think we'll get, I think we'll get to there eventually. 
Now, there's a new food allergy practice parameter that's close to being prepared. I know you're on the work group that's developing that. Is there anything specific that, or, uh, you know, earth shaking that's going to come out in that parameter that you think we should know about? Yeah, I, mean, I actually not on it there. Um, well, you're not? Yeah, the, like Brian is here and some others. But okay. I, I, but not that I've heard that's going to come out of that that's like different than what people have been talking about or different that are in the NIH guidelines from a couple years ago. I don't oh. think it's anything like way, way new is coming out of it. Oh, okay. Right. Can I ask yes, one more. Um, Dr. Burke, just a quick question. Um, I was looking at the graph there that you have on the oral immunotherapy and looking at the specific um, antigen, like, the Tregs and kind of the TH2 response. Um, the one thing I noticed is that the T regulatory cells will increase like around 12 months of being on oral immunotherapy, but then that starts to drop between yep. kind of the 12, 24 months. Um, is this similar in FLIT as well? And kind of why is that T regulatory component dropping like in between that period of desensitization? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I think what people anticipated that thinking that you outgrow food allergy by your T regulatory cells going up, I don't. I think that's probably not true necessarily. Uh, there are ten articles about that alone, and half of them show that as you outgrow it, your T regulatory cells go up, and the other half show that they don't. So there's not a even in the natural outgrowth, there's not a good answer to it. What we anticipated with immunotherapy is that the T regs would go up and stay up. And it, that's only numbers. If you look at like a percentage of CD4, CD25 high cells, what's not been done are functional studies. So, do the if you have ten cells and now there are five cells, do those five cells function equivalent to ten cells? But at least number-wise, for that study and the COFAR studies, the numbers initially go up and then they begin to fall as you continue immunotherapy. And do you see this similar pattern then in sublingual immunotherapy too? Yes, it's just you know it okay. takes longer for that rise in the T regs to go up. So that rather than a year, the peak is a little bit later, but then you still see the same fall. And what kind of functional study is there to look at that? I mean, I, I I'm not familiar with this. Like yeah, just like like isolating the cells and looking at the as you measure their function. How, how they might um, in cell cell studies, like taking isolating T regs and then in culture and then with other cells, what happens is they contact cells as far as their cytokines that they release. Those are the types of functional studies. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to have to stop there. You, as always, you're a fund of knowledge and a wealth of information. We really appreciate the the uh, the uh, uh, presentation. Um, so, uh, uh, Dr. Wesley Burke from the University of North Carolina, um, have a great uh, week and thank you for joining us today. Okay, guys. Thanks a lot. It's nice to meet you. See you. Thank you. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to ACAAI.org. next time.